The Human Genome Project advances in brain scan technology. The Human Connectome Project. Discovery by discovery, science is inching us closer to a greater understanding of what makes our brains tick. Does that mean we're any closer to understanding the self? Well, joining us now to help answer that in Los Angeles, California, Jennifer Willette. She's a science journalist and author of Me, Myself, and Why? Searching for the Science of Self. And Jennifer, as I welcome you to TVO tonight, you've got to start by telling us where that title comes from. That's very catchy. <laughs> well, you know, we wanted to capture some essence when we were banding around ideas for a title of a book. We kind of wanted to get the idea of there's me, myself, and I, but we really, the book is focused less on who I am, but why I am certain ways. Because I kind of know who I am, but why I am the way I am, that to me was the central question of the book and it's just seen that that was a really catchy way to capture that aspect why does that question interest you so much well for a couple of reasons i mean the most obvious one is that i'm adopted child and that basically means that you spend an entire lifetime answering medical questions medical history questions with i really don't know um, so you all, I've always wondered that the whole nature versus nurture question was very relevant to me. I mean, how much of who I am is due to my genes um, and what I got from biological parents whom I've never met and know nothing about? How much is from environment, um, the influence of my, of my parents, my adoptive parents, and how much is up to me you know, as I go through life and develop as an individual? And it turns out that the answer is kind of a combination of all of those things. Which we'll explore during the course of our conversation. I want to just actually quote a quote that you have uh, right near the beginning of the book, it's G.K. Chesterton from more than a century ago who says, one may understand the cosmos, but never the ego. The self is more distant than any star. And I wonder whether a century later, that's still apt. <laughs> I think it is. You know, the irony, of course, the reason I love that just Chesterton quote and why I chose it for, for the, uh, the book's epigram is because I normally write about things like physics and cosmology and, and some of these more um, esoteric things. Um, and they were simple compared to trying to pin down, you know, the aspects of the self. Uh, so to me, that was, you know, the, the perfect way to capture that. And there's just, we, we've, there's been an explosion of research. We know so much more than we knew back 100 years ago when Chesterton was writing. But of course, the way science works is you answer one question and you open up 10 more. I mean, that's part of the, the joy of scientific discovery in the first place. And the, it just seems that the more we learn about the science of self, the more we realize how far we have to go before we can really understand it. Some of the answers you got, I presume, was when you had your genome sequenced. Tell us about that experience. Yes, I did it through 23andMe, which has been in the news lately. <laughs> um, but uh, what they basically do is you spit into a tube and you seal, the ca seal it up in a little in, in, in a, with a cap and then you send it off to a sequencing lab and they come back and they do sort of, it's not a full genome sequencing, but they, it's more of a genotyping where they'll take certain known genetic variants for certain kinds of traits or conditions and they'll just test for all of those. And so they can tell you or within a certain percentage, you know, what your eye color would be likely to be or, you know, what some of your elevated risks are for certain health conditions, um, uh, what your ethnic uh, background might be, uh, which as an adopted person, I mean, I kind of knew a little bit about that, but I was pleased to see that the test confirmed that I am, in fact, fully half Norwegian. I've got a lot of Scandinavian in me, and it really shows. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, it, it was a fun test to take. It was fun to go through the results. What other information did you find out about yourself that you, um, that you feel comfortable sharing? Well, you know, I'm kind of an open book. I mean, there's, <laughs> I, have, I have wet earwax, so <laughs> which I'm sure is fascinating to people. Um, I guess the main thing that I learned was how to assess the probabilities, you know, because, you know, genes are complicated. It's not like you know, you have like one gene that you can turn on and off. Um, I kind of thought that would be the case, but it's not, particularly when it comes to health-related uh, concerns. One of the first uh, genetic variants they found was, was uh, for Huntington's. And that really is kind of a, a one gene, one trait kind of approach, where if you have that variant, you will get Huntington's. But most of the other genes don't work that way. So for example, why I might have an elevated risk of age-related macular degeneration, which concerns me, my eyes are important, mm -hmm. um, it's only slight. 
And it doesn't mean that I will absolutely develop it. It just means that perhaps I should take good care of my eyes and get them regularly checked, being aware of the fact that I might have that slightly elevated risk. There's always a certain amount of uncertainty. And when most of us make health decisions, we're kind of weighing that. We're trying to navigate our way through what we know, what we don't know, you know, weighing, you know, cost versus benefit. And I think that genotyping, rather than being some sort of magic oracle, is one more tool that can help us navigate that. Let me do one more quote from the book, and this time not Chesterton, but Willette. I'm going to quote you this time on the issue of genes, and here we go. Forget everything you tell us. Forget everything you've heard about the warrior gene, the gay gene, the drunk gene, or the optimism gene. There just aren't enough genes in the human genome for the one gene, one trait model to work. Um, help us out with that a little more, because, of course, I suppose a lot of people would like to think that once you have your genetic understanding fulfilled, there's a predetermination in what you're going to be and who you're going to be, and I guess you're here to tell us that ain't so. Is that right? Well, it's partly so. I mean, I, the best way of thinking of it is that genes are deterministic, but they're not destiny. I think one of the best uh, analogies was one that I found by reading a book by Dean Hamer, where he basically says that the genetic code and how it, like, how your brain and synapses form, all of that kind of determines what instrument you are, so to speak, um, but it does not determine the kind of music you can play. It might put constraints on it. I'm probably never going to be a star NBA basketball player. You know, I just don't have the genetic profile for that. Um, but within the constraints of my own genetic profile, there's a whole lot that I can do, a whole different, lots of different kinds of music that I can play. And I think that's kind of the best way to look at it. There are some things we can change, but we can also take that raw material and we do have some say in how it gets shaped and evolves over time. Well, for example, when you hear people say to you, as I'm sure they do, I have an addictive personality, do you think that's <laughs> genetically based? You know, I, I'm very leery of saying things like, I have an addictive personality, because what actually does that mean? Um, I, there's a whole chapter in the book on alcoholism. Uh, it's actually exploring why I'm such a lightweight, why I am not an alcoholic, because it turns out that, in fact, according to the 23andMe uh, test results, I have a slightly elevated risk for alcoholism. I am, in fact, the anti-alcoholic. And that's very informative, because what it tells you is, Sure, there was a couple of different kinds of genes that they were testing for that where I might have an elevated risk, but there's a whole lot of different things that go into alcoholism. It's more than just one single personality trait. It's more than just one gene or a certain configuration of brain synapses. It's a whole bunch of these elements working together, and certain people, they just kind of hit the trifecta and get, uh, you know, cross the threshold and become alcoholics. Mm. Um, so it's important to, to bear that in mind, that it's, it's lots of different genes working together to affect behavior, but when it comes to behaviors, and addiction and alcoholism are a behavior, you've also got environmental influence, you've got, you know, brain chemistry. Uh, many, many times you hear alcoholics talk about how they self-medicate, and there's some scientific evidence that there's a reason for that. You know, there's, they're, they're actually, it's their way of regulating their brain chemistry, so to speak. Um, so, be, I would be very careful about saying, I have an addictive personality. You know, you could say that, you know, I have certain heightened risks for addiction, and therefore I'm a little more watchful um, than the average person. Hmm. Well, you do talk in the book about Craig Ferguson, the late night American. Yes. Uh, I guess he's on U.S. television, but he's from, of course, overseas, the uh, late night talk show host who, who deals with this all the time, right? Yes, he's been, he's been very open uh, about his alcoholism, which I really appreciate. And he's like a textbook clinical alcoholic um, from, the, from the first drink that he took all the way to when he actually, be, you know, he has this wonderful moment in uh, his uh, autobiography, American on Purpose, where he describes the moment where he went from wanting a drink to needing a drink. And that's, that's kind of like that, that flip, that, swi that, that switch that flips when someone goes from just being a heavy drinker to being a clinical alcoholic. Um, and the way he writes about it, it's clear that, you know, he had a lot of anxiety and alcoholism made him feel better. Alcohol made him feel better, so he tended to you know, drink a lot. Um, ironically, alcohol does not affect me that way. It doesn't make me feel energized and happy. It makes me feel sleepy and kind of depressed. <laughs> so <laughs> how alcohol affects you is, is another factor in whether or not you might become an alcoholic. How about this other one? What's the Prozac gene? Yeah, that's interesting. That, that's tied to depression. You know, I, I'm very fortunate not to suffer from that particular form of depression, but there does seem to be a gene or a cluster of genes that um, if you have a certain version of it, long versus short, it affects how effectively your brain 
processes serotonin, which is a neurochemical that we know is related in some way to depression. Most antidepressants actually target the serotonin receptors for a reason. Um, so that is something that definitely has a genetic component. Um, again, you know, there's always a genetic element, and genes are very, very powerful things. But there's other factors that also come into play. Um, I think that we're just beginning to learn a little bit more about things like depression and how they work, and really looking forward to seeing the next 10 years, because I think that a lot of people struggle with this, and as we understand a little bit more about that serotonin system and how we can manipulate it and, and treat it, um, maybe we can start addressing this thing that so many people struggle with. Mm -hmm. Let's move from genetics to the brain. You've talked about something called the Human Connectome Project, and I think we need to know more about what that is. So tell us, please. Well, I think if you, if you look at what's been happening in neuroscience over the last hundred years, a lot of the focus has been on mapping brain regions, kind of figuring out which parts of the brain are involved in which kind of activity. And our understanding has kind of evolved um, in the last 10, 15 years or so. Neuroscientists now talk less of specific regions of brains and more about sort of an inter integrated network of networks, this whole complicated system of connections. And what the Connectome Project is designed to do is look at the individual synapses, the, the kinds of long-range, you know, connections that get made between neurons, um, the things that, you know, cells that, fi that fire together, wire together, our brains get wired up, and that has a huge, tremendous impact on who we are, our sense of self. Um, it, it can, it, you know, it affects everything, because the brain, the self is very much influenced by the brain. So that's what they're trying to do, and it's a huge project. They've done this just for the, uh, the C. elegans, the nematode. That thing only has 302 neurons and it took them 10 years hmm. to map it and uh, the human brain has hundreds of billions of neurons so you can imagine just how long that that could take um, they're, they're doing they're coming up with some high throughput techniques to try to make that go faster Again, I would say a caution, though, because we did this with the human genome, remember. We, we spent, you know, 10, 20 years on this enormous project to map it, finally achieved it, and we have learned a great deal from it, but we have also learned how much we don't know. Genes turned out to be far more complicated than we ever hoped to, to, to think, and, of course, I think the same thing is going to be true of the connectome. Okay. You also looked at what neuroscientists call the default network in the brain, right. and what role does it play in our sense of ourselves? It's actually the most fundamental aspect. It's kind of like the proto-self, and we share it with a number of, you know, animals. It's basically how your brain determines which, what is you and what isn't you. What, what is that self-other divide? So it, it maps the body, so to speak. Um, back in the 1950s, I think a guy named Wilder Penfield uh, managed to, while he was operating on epileptic patients, he would test them and, you know, how certain touching certain regions of the brain would affect them. And he was able to sort of note that, you know, certain parts of the body were mapped onto certain parts of the brain. And the wonderful thing about this is just how flexible the brain is when it comes to the sense of self. That was probably the most surprising thing when I started writing this book, was that we think of the self as this kind of fixed entity, and it's really not. I mean, there might be a fixed core somewhere, but the self is actually multifaceted, constantly changing, constantly evolving, and the brain is a big part of why that can do so. And the most interesting thing, of course, is when it comes to body mapping, the brain will incorporate things. Uh, if you think of a blind man who uses a cane, over time, that cane will get incorporated into his body map. It literally becomes an extension of himself. And one of the most fascinating bits of research, I think, that I uh, talk about in the book that I, that I learned was if you take a, a virtual world and you build an avatar and you set up sort of a haptic feedback where a, a sense of touch with that avatar, you can bond. Your brain will actually incorporate that. Um, that feedback, and it will literally become a physical extension of you. That's kind of where we're going in the future with some of these new technologies, and it's very exciting. And it's also indicative of just how flexible the brain and the sense of self is. All right. Speaking of exciting, I think I need you to tell us about your little experience with Timothy, Timothy Leary here. Uh, you tried LSD. And I want to know, know why you did it and what you learned from it. It's a funny story, you know, I'm, I, like I'm the anti-alcoholic, I'm also like the person who never does drugs. Um, I, I, they just don't react well with me. But I was having dinner with, uh, with some friends and telling them about this uh, book that I was writing on the, on the science of self and how we construct identity. And uh, one of them was, shall we say, a child of the 60s, <laughs> and basically said, well, in that case, you really need to try acid. 
And I went, oh, you guys are always pushing this stuff on me. It can't be that, fa that amazing. And he just said, no, no, it's not about whether or not it's amazing. He goes, if you're interested in the question of self, in the question of ego, and you want to know what it's like not to have that ego, then you really need to try acid. And that very much intrigued me. And so we ended up, it took a few months to kind of get up the nerve and then kind of figure out how to do it, because it's not like I have like some acid dealer on the corner. <laughs> and my husband and I both did it, and we, uh, we went to a beach house and controlled our environment, and we had someone on speed dial in case there was a problem. There wasn't. And uh, we just kind of went with it. And it was actually a, a really interesting experience. Among other things, I discovered that I become that person at the party when I'm dropping acid. If you've seen that episode of Mad Men where they do acid, there's just one woman who's like crawling around on the floor, bonding with the rug. And I'm sorry to say that was me. Um, <laughs> because <laughs> it messes with that body map that I was talking about. You know, I noticed that you know, my hand would kind of like melt into the, the, uh, the, the pattern of the, of the rug and it would kind of crawl up my skin and that's just fascinating to watch. And if I tried to take notes, my hand would kind of uh, sink into the paper. And when you close your eyes, your sense of a physical body just kind of disappears and it's like your consciousness is sort of floating in this sea of molecules and kind of connected with everything else. And it sounds very weird and new agey, but in fact that is very much what it feels like. What was interesting to me was uh, a couple of studies that I found that were done with people under the influence of psychedelics um, in 2012 and 2013 over in England, and they found that it's actually not an increase in brain activity that's happening when you do psychedelics. Um, a lot of what the brain does is impose constraints and limit our perceptions and, and our reality. And what LSD and other psychedelics do is sort of temporarily loosen those constraints. It literally is expanding your doors of perception. It's literally like a special chemical lens or filter that you're able to put on and see things that you would otherwise, your brain would filter out. Um, so from that, from that standpoint, I think uh, it was definitely a, a worthy experiment for the book. So. Well, I think Steve Jobs did say doing LSD, I think the quote is, was one of the two or three most important things I have done with my life. I mean, do you want to go that far in, in describing your experience that way? I've done a lot of really useful, important, meaningful things in my life, so I don't think I'd go that far, but um, it certainly was illuminating. It certainly did make me think a little more deeply about the sense of self and how much of who we think we are is, really is a construct. Um, I kind of liked that. Uh, so, you know, absolutely life-changing, not so much. Extremely compelling and illuminating, yes. Um, among other things, you kind of chill out a little bit about death because it really does kind of drive home the fact that, you know, your stuff is kind of the same stuff as the stuff that's out in the universe, and when you die, it's all going to merge together, and it's kind of good. Uh, you did write in the book, psychedelics might revolutionize neuroscience if they can just shake off that 60s stigma. You think that's still there 50 years later? I think it's less so, I mean, but, but that's still fairly recent. It's really only in the last like four or five years that I think that um, more, more scientists have been really pushing to do experiments and, and various studies with some of these psychedelics. Um, there was a lot of fear-mongering. You know, some of it was legit, some not so much, um, back from the culture wars. Uh, psychedelics have a class one classification, which basically says that they have no medical benefits whatsoever. And there's overwhelming evidence at this point, you know, that that's simply not the case. Um, they're useful. They, I mean, LSD was originally invented and used as a treatment for anxiety disorders, for depression, for post-traumatic stress, things like that. Um, because it, it's very similar to serotonin, which we were talking about earlier. So it, it t attaches to those same receptors. So it can have similar calming effects. Um, and other, other psychedelics have been useful as, you know, there's promise there for potentially, you know, treating Parkinson's or, you know, end-of-life counseling. Um, actually, peyote, which is uh, practiced in certain tribal, you know, uh, communities, those communities that, 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 uh, practice, that, that use peyote in their religious ceremonies have much, much lower rates of alcoholism. Hmm. The guy that I interviewed who, who uh, studied that tribe basically said peyote just really hates alcohol. Hmm. And so alcoholics tend, clinical alcoholics, say like Craig Ferguson, tend not to like psychedelics. And in fact, there's another chapter or episode in Ferguson's book where he says just that, that the one time he did acid, it was a horrible experience for him. Everything he was trying to run away from ended up being brought to the fore, and it was terrifying. Um, so... It, it, it's one of those things. Uh, if, if you're using it to, say, treat post-traumatic stress, 
uh, with, say, war veterans, and you've got a licensed professional therapist there with them to help work through the trauma, then I think it can be a very useful thing. But if you're just doing it on your own, I think it is possible for it to be a little terrifying because psychedelics, they might be safe, but they're unpredictable, and they might not, you may not have a pleasant experience. Understood. Let's talk about consciousness here. And you compare consciousness to gold, and I want you to explain <laughs> that for us if you can. Well, I, I actually compare consciousness to how gold acquires certain properties. Um, we tend to, for a long time, ever since Rene Descartes, there's been this notion of a ghost in a machine. You know, and any one of us who's lost a loved one and has seen the dead body, we have this very real sense of something, ha something essential having departed. And that, I think, is what, for lack of a better word, we call a soul. Um, it turns out that modern neuroscience has something a little more complicated to say about that. You know, it's not that mind is separate from matter, it's that matter is mind and mind is matter and you can't separate those two. Uh, and the reason it comes about, if you think about, you know, what is a lump of gold? Gold is a collection of, you know, millions or billions of atoms and gold has properties. It has temperature, it has hardness, it has color, it has sheen. Um, those properties are not inherent in the atoms. They emerge. They're, they're, you know, all, all the interactions of those atoms give rise to this second order thing, this higher level thing, and that is the property of temperature, for example, or color. And that's kind of how consciousness works. Remember I said that you know, we have, our brain is like a network of networks and you have billions of these neurons firing with all these little synapses and talking to each other. And all that information um, slowly builds up to a threshold and you get this emergent property of consciousness. And when all that is disrupted in some way, which can sometimes happen uh, when you're under anesthesia or in a coma, um, your brain is still functioning and it's still taking in information, but because it's not being sent to central headquarters, it's not being integrated, uh, we're not conscious of it. So it's very clear that these things are connected in some way to the conscious self. And, you know, we kind of understand the, ba the basic wakefulness element, but neuroscientists really are still struggling with the higher, when we talk about consciousness in terms of the meta-consciousness of how we feel and our thoughts and how we have a persistent, distinct personality. We go to sleep at night and we technically lose consciousness that we wake up and we remember who we are and our personality reasserts itself. Um, we don't really know, or neuroscientists really don't know yet how that works. That's kind of, I think, what's going to be the next 50 or 60 years of research. So expanding on that metaphor, we are then, therefore, more than just the sum of our parts. There was something beyond yes. that. Exactly. I mean, we, we are greater than the sum of our parts. Greater than the sum which of I our think parts, is a right. Which I think is a wonderful metaphor for, for self, because as I said, I had a hard time just defining what we mean by self. Because uh, William James, I think, describes self as everything, your possessions, your personality, the people you love, your loved ones, your physical self, all these things. Um, and I think even more so uh, today, that's true. The self is kind of an umbrella term that incorporates all of those things to greater and lesser degrees. Uh, we, our self is greater than the sum of all those parts. And it turns out that consciousness works along the same principle. Jennifer, I'm going to read one more excerpt from your book, and here it comes. You can sequence my DNA, scan my brain, map my connectome, subject me to any number of psychological tests, even hypothetically map out the position and velocity of every single subatomic particle that makes up my mind and body, but you won't find my essence in any one of them alone. If you took a digital image of me and broke it down into the component pixels, in one sense, you would have a complete description of that image, neatly rendered in zeros and ones, but that information is meaningless without an interpretive layer that enables you to see the complete picture. Stories provide that unifying interpretive layer. Uh, I'm not even sure what question I want to ask coming out of that, other than something <laughs> like, I, I am a storyteller and therefore I am, something like that. Well, it, yes, yes. In fact, there's a wonderful book uh, from a couple years ago by Jonathan Gottschall called The Storytelling Animal. Stories are kind of a hot topic now, you know, in neuroscience, in, in psychology, in cognitive psychology, because increasingly I think we're beginning to understand just how much we rely on stories to make sense of the world and also of ourselves. It's this whole notion of a personal narrative. Um, one of the most fascinating uh, men that I spoke to for that, for, when I, for this book, he has been, he's at Northwestern, and he's been essentially having people tell him their life stories for the last 15, 20 years to try and pinpoint what the different kinds of narratives. And, and we really do, on some level, 
we have all these memories and all these experiences and they're all kind of a jumble and a lot of what we do is create a narrative out of that. And it may or may not be true. Obviously it's going to be based in fact, but the memory is faulty. And over time, you know, we start to take some, shall we say, poetic license with, with, with the facts. Uh, and that ends up becoming how we shape our sense of who we are, how we present ourselves to the world, that whole notion of a constructed identity. So for me, the narrative self, you know, which is built out of our, our autobiographical memories and experiences, is ultimately what matters for us as human beings. All the other aspects that I talk about are important. We absolutely want to understand more about the brain, the human genome. We want to understand you know, personality studies, all of these things. We want to understand how we relate to our virtual digital selves, you know, how much of those are us and how much are, you know, again, something divorced from us. But ultimately, it's the stories we tell that give our life meaning. And you know, that, I think, is, is what resonates most with the average person. It's certainly what resonates most with me. I think in that last answer, you anticipated my next question, which is, are we fiction <laughs> writers if we're storytellers, or are we more hard-nosed reporters for the LA Times kind of storytellers? You know, it's funny. I, I, I coined the term the accidental fabulist, because it's, it's less so that we're liars, so to speak, and more that we're myth makers. I think I compare it more to how we construct myths. You know, myths may or may not be based on fact. They're stories we tell to kind of explain the world. Um, and they get at a deeper truth, so to speak, that maybe they're not technically correct factually, but they are true on a much deeper level. And that, I think, is what we are. We're myth makers. Hmm, myth makers. All right. In our last minute here, I, I should ask you the sort of concluding question, which is, after having written the book, has your sense of yourself changed? It's more that it's deepened rather than changed. Um, I think I'm much more aware now of how much of who I am is a construct, which can be both good and bad. You know, it, it, to, to a certain extent, there's things that I can control and things that I can't. And I think that having written this book, I'm much more able now to tell the difference. You know, what, what is it that, that sobriety's prayer, you know, give, give me the you know, strength to change what I can and the wisdom to know the difference. <laughs> you know, accept what I can't change, change what I can, and be able to tell the difference is, is kind of what having written this book helps me do, I think. Gotcha. It's so good of you to come on TVO tonight and share your thoughts with it. Me, myself, and why? Searching for the science of self. Jennifer Willette, thank you for being there on the line from Los Angeles, California. Good night. Oh, it's, it's been my pleasure. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.